here we are right at the very beginning. This is a, uh, uh, a long road. This is probably one of the uh, best textbooks underlying this course, which is the Hall book. It's the standard uh, for options, uh, uh, futures, and other derivatives in any course at uh, either the upper upper level undergraduate courses in finance or at the MBA level. So it is uh, at times challenging. Uh, however, uh, here's, a, here's a promise to you that if you can get through this, um, it elevates you above all others who can't in, in this field. It is the standard. So I'm going to try to get you through each chapter uh, in a little bit, uh, not such a, a hard academic way, but with uh, a huge amount of real-world experience with futures, options, and derivatives that I can bring a, a, perhaps a, a better insight into some of the topics. So here we go. We're just going <clears> to <throat> jump right into uh, the first chapter uh, and start uh, as if you'd never seen these before. So derivatives, what are they? Well, they are, at the very heart, financial instruments. Uh, whose value depends on, or I put in brackets here, is derived from, and you'll notice, derived is the root of derivatives, and that's how we get the word derivative, because its value is derived from the value of some other, and this is a critical word. A lot of other definitions sort of skip this, but this is critical. Some other more basic underlying variable. So let's deal with the more basic this means that whatever the financial instrument is deriving its value from, that particular asset has a price that's closer to the value of it itself. So for instance, if uh, uh, you have an option on a stock, the option derives its value from the price of the stock, but the price of the stock derives its value from the value of, of the company itself. It's next in line, in other words. So it's not that uh, it, it derives its value off of something more complex or more higher order, like a, like a second order derivative. You can't go the other way. And it says uh, it derives the value of some other more basic underlying variable. Now, why didn't I put underlying asset? Why am I putting underlying variable there? Well, it's because it doesn't necessarily have to be an asset. Uh, it could be a real asset. Uh, like property. It could be a financial asset, and a financial asset could be a, a share of stock. It could be an index, whether it be a stock index, a housing price index, the rate of inflation, the index that tracks the rate of inflation, it could be an index. It could even be just an event. It could be just an event. Uh, for instance, uh, the, uh, the amount of snowfall in a given region. Perhaps uh, uh, a ski resort wants to hedge against a bad winter, and maybe there's an option for the uh, uh, bet that they can make, a derivative uh, available, that bets on the amount of, of snowfall that pays off if it's under a certain amount and doesn't if it's over a certain amount. We can all think of catastrophe bonds, or what are called cat bonds. Uh, that cat bonds will pay off except in the event of a catastrophe. Uh, so if a cat catastrophe happens, then obviously it doesn't. So that's why it's called an underlying variable as opposed to an underlying asset because the underlying doesn't necessarily need to be an asset. An event is not an asset. So let's very be very clear about the definition of a derivative to be inclusive. It is derived from the value of some other more basic underlying variable. Now, derivatives can be exchange-traded or over-the-counter. Exchange-traded are standardized contracts. OTC can be standardized, but they allow for a lot of customization that can't be found on exchanges. Uh, on exchange-traded, a buyer and a seller uh, come together to form a contract. We'll see later on that all derivatives require a buyer and a seller. And they they uh, enter their contract through a clearinghouse so that the clearinghouse is the counterparty to all contracts. The buyer enters into a contract with the clearinghouse and the seller enters into a contract with the clearinghouse. It eliminates counterparty risk. If the buyer wins and the seller can't pay, well, that's a big problem. But the clearinghouse is counterparty to all and there's never been a default on an exchange-traded derivative. Never. 
highly regulated. Highly regulated because they're exchange traded, which means they're available to people. Anybody can, can uh, make a transaction in a futures contract or an options contract, so a lot of regulation there to protect the investors. On OTC, uh, uh, they can, the uh, transaction is between a buyer and a seller. This is called bilateral clearing. But as we can see here, if the buyer wins big and the seller loses, if the seller is unable to pay, the buyer hasn't really won anything, have they? In other words, they're in a position as if they had never entered into the contract to begin with, which, well, what was the point of that? Or, and this is really becoming more and more popular now, ever since uh, 2008, 2009, that really changed a lot of opinions about about this wild, wild west over-the-counter derivative trading. Now, the buyer and seller can opt to clear through a central party, uh, a central counterparty, which means that they can eliminate counterparty risk by opting to choose a central counterparty. Not only that, a lot of regulation is pushing this marketplace to say, look, if it can be cleared by a central counterparty, do it. The more standardized or the less customized the OTC contract is, the more this becomes necessary and not just uh, optional. But slowly and slowly, it's moving towards more and more of these of these OTC derivatives being being cleared through a central counterparty, so that it reduces this kind of counterparty risk. The OTC market is less regulated. I'm not going to say there's no regulation. This is highly regulated. Exchange trade is highly regulated. OTC is just less regulated. Not as highly regulated. It's less regulated. But this regulation is increasing. Will it ever get to the level of, of the exchange traded? Probably not. Because you don't want to uh, constrain the ability for customization here. And these are, these are intelligent people. These are institutions that are trading. They're not, they're not retail traders. They're institutions. So they know what they're doing. They don't need that kind of protection. They need flexibility. Uh, they have the responsibility uh, uh, to deal with that flexibility. Uh, so let them go, right? So it's less regulated. Regulation is increasing, but it'll never get to the point where it's as regulated as an exchange. Dollar value-wise, uh, the over-the-counter market is roughly about 12 times larger than the exchange-traded market. In terms of the principal dollars underlying the assets. That's all it is in terms of the principal dollars underlying the assets. If we look at the value of the contracts itself, um, the exchange traded actually is larger. If we look at just the value, the market value of the financial, uh, remember these are financial instruments, so if we had to settle up everything, just the dollar value of them, uh, the exchange traded is larger. But the dollars underlying the assets in the over-the-counter market are about 12 times larger. But keep in mind, these are institutional traders. They may uh, One contract may represent $100 million, whereas on an exchange-traded uh, uh, marketplace, uh, a, I think the largest uh, Forex uh, contract I've seen is for, if you get into the Swedish and the Norwegian Krona, uh, they can amount to, depending on the exchange rate, up to 200, uh, 250, 300,000 uh, US. Uh, that's considered a large contract. The standard contract in most foreign currency on the futures market is about uh, $100,000. The British pound is 62.5. So they vary, but they're nowhere near 100 million. Well, one contract here could represent 100 million. So when we say that it's much, much, much larger, uh, it's in terms of the the principal value of the underlying assets, not the value of the derivative contract itself. In, the, in this introduction, I'm just going to introduce some of the terminology that we'll be looking at in more detail later on, but we'll start with forwards or forward agreements. And it is an agreement to buy or sell, to buy or sell a specific asset, often referred to as the underlying asset, at a specific price and since we're talking about forwards, we're talking about a delivery price. When we talk about options, we talk about an exercise price. But this would be a delivery price at a specific price at a certain future date. Ten, and we tend to call this the delivery date. 
When we uh, look at options, we'll call that the exercise date or the expiration date, but this will be the delivery date. So it's an agreement to buy or sell a specific asset at a specific price agreed on today, agreed on at the time that we enter into the contract, but to be delivered at some future date. So we'll agree on the asset and the future date at which we'll, we'll trade it, but we'll agree on a price today. It's called a forward contract. They're OTC traded, over-the-counter traded. If the forward is exchange traded, it is simply called a future. That's just the difference between forwards and futures. When you hear the term forward, that means it's OTC traded. When you hear the term futures, it's a forward agreement that just happens to be exchange traded. That's all. A buyer has a long position, a seller has a short position. You need a buyer and a seller to every derivative contract. There has to be a long and a short, simple as that. Both parties are obligated to perform. This is key. Both are obligated. Obligated. Both have an obligation. When we look at options, we'll see that that's not true in options. But for forwards and futures, both parties to the contract, buyer and seller, are obligated to do something. There is no cost to enter a forward or future agreement other than paying the commission on the exchange uh, or paying any kind of commission. On a futures exchange, however, there will be margin, but the margin doesn't leave your account. The key point here is that no money trades hands when the contract is entered. I don't have to, if I'm the buyer, I don't have to pay the seller anything today. I may have to segregate a certain amount of my money as margin, but I don't have to part with it. So that's important. Let's look at some payoff graphs. You're going to have to get used to these. If you don't like payoff graphs, stop now. Stop now because there's a lot of these uh, throughout the uh, throughout all the, the textbook. Well, here's what we, we need some terminology. S sub T is the spot price at time T. A spot price means uh, a, a spot market, the price in a spot market. And a spot market is what you can buy and sell it for right then and there, at that point in time right now. That's called a spot market. So you can think of a stock market as a spot market. At any point, what's the what's a 100 shares of IBM trading at? I want to buy it right now. Go ahead. Well, that's the spot price. That's the spot market. And K is the delivery price. K will be the specific price that, uh, uh, that the parties agree to. The certain future date will be at time T sometime in the future. So let's look at uh, an example. An agreement to buy or sell an asset for $100 in three months. So T is three months, K is, is, is 100, so we can put K down here representing the buyer and the seller. Both are obligated to perform something at that $100 mark. So there is K in terms of the buyer, and here is K in terms of the seller. We'll put buyer up here, and we'll put seller down here to show their payoff charts. Well, let's uh, look at two examples here. Let's say that uh, uh, in example one, if the spot price uh, equals $150 at time T, the buyer makes $50. How do I arrive at that? Because uh, they've agreed to trade it in three months at 100 so the seller must sell to the buyer for 100 in 3 months time the spot price is 150 it doesn't matter there's an agreement to trade at the price of $100 so they trade at $100 the buyer can immediately sell in the spot market at 150 thereby making $50 so we can see that the buyer would make $50 at time t however the seller would have to has to deliver the asset to the buyer. So the seller would have to go into the spot market, pay $150 for it, and then sell it for $100. The seller would lose $50. Well, if the spot market, uh, uh, the spot price at uh, uh, time T is $75, the buyer loses $25, don't they? Because they still must perform. They're obligated to buy it for $100. They sell it, they're going to lose $25, whereas the seller will make the $25. So we can see very, very quickly here that this is a zero sum. Zero sum because 
For the buyer to make a dollar, the seller must lose a dollar. No wealth is created in a derivatives contract. Let's be clear about that now. No wealth is created, only transferred. So for the buyer to win, the seller must lose. But for the seller to win, the buyer must lose. And if we draw our charts, we can see that they are asymmetrical in terms of payoff, dollar for dollar, so that if you add these two together, you will get a straight line. <clears throat> so we have a gain here with a loss here, it nets to zero. And if you draw them out together, you will get a straight line showing no wealth creation, only wealth transfer. This is an important point to remember. For a buyer to win, the seller must lose. For a seller to win, the buyer must lose. The sum of their gains and losses always sum to zero. It is a zero sum. And that's what a payoff graph looks like. So we can see where the payoff is each time. When we get into options, keep in mind here, there was no cost to enter. So basically the payoff is, is a linear relationship with the price of the underlying asset, with the spot price. Once we have options, there is a cost to enter these payoff graphs change. There's forwards, futures. Nice introduction. We're going to get into it in a lot more. This is just something to introduce you to it.